thanks for listening to the Adulting is Easy podcast. This is Lauren, and I manage the Adulting is Easy blog and podcast, which can be found at realadultingiseasy.com and anywhere you listen to podcasts. Please take a second and hit the follow button wherever you're listening, if you can safely do so. And if you haven't yet, please rate and review where you're listening. I'm joined today by Joe Meese, a 42-year-old married father of two living and operating out of Denver, Colorado. Over the past 20 years, he and his wife have built a portfolio of nine long-term rentals and three short-term rentals. When not juggling property management, he enjoys spending time with his family, going out to eat, attending local festivals and events, and traveling. Thanks for joining me, Joe. Happy to be here. This episode is sponsored by Jasmine Mortgage Team. Jasmine Mortgage Team is fire-minded and loved by both real estate investors and first-time home buyers. Jasmine and her team can help you get a mortgage for a new home purchase or even a refinance or a cash out refinance. Head on over to jasminemortgageteam.com and tell them Lauren from Adulting is Easy sent you. That's jasminemortgageteam.com. Our goal for today is to make adulting easier for listeners by discussing a personal finance topic since managing money is a big part of adulting. Today, the topic is real estate and we're going to dive in how to get more direct bookings for your short-term rentals. But first, Joe, let's get into your background a bit a little bit more than we did, if you will, in your bio. And I'm particularly interested, when you got started in real estate, did you get started with short-term rentals or did you start with long-term rentals? So I actually got started in 2006. Totally wasn't planned. It was a a property that I owned in Denver, um, single family home, four bedroom, two bathroom. I had lived in it for four years and there was another community in Denver that I was looking to move into Uh, So, you know, naturally, most people would sell their first home when they're going to buy their second home. But being that it was 2006 and there was pretty much no regulation, no paperwork, you know, they were giving out loans to anybody left and right. I was basically given the option to say, hey, you can buy this next house with pretty much nothing down. I think I put like thirty five hundred down on a I think the purchase price was four hundred and fifty five thousand for that second house. So by having the opportunity to do that, I was like, hey, I, you know, I want to keep this first house. It's a cool house. I enjoyed living here. I'll make it a rental and then see what happens. But um, I knew that long term, it would be, you know, a savvy move to keep that first property. That's interesting. I did the same thing where I bought a second primary and rented my first out. And that's a great way to get started because even now, you can put less down on a house that's owner occupied. So if you do that, you get to keep that loan if you move out, even if you're renting it to somebody. So that can still be a really good financial move. But wow, 3,500 down on a $450,000 house. I just, that sounds, that's just, it's just so crazy nowadays to think that way. Yeah. I mean, and obviously that's why probably a lot of people got into trouble in 2008, you know, because they were letting anyone do that. So that's how we got, that's how I got started with my first rental. The second rental, um, similar story, you know, wasn't purchased as an investment property. It was actually a two bedroom condo that my wife owned on, it was a a suburb on the South side of Denver. And then when we got married in 2009, uh, she moved into the house that I was living in my second home. And then we converted that condo into what would be our second rental. And what year was that? Uh, we got married in May of 2009. So immediately after that, she moved into my house and then we turned that property into a rental. Okay. So your first two rentals kind of straddled this basically catastrophic collapse of the housing market. What was that like? You know, it, was, it wasn't too bad. Um, we both had good jobs. Uh, I was working in the like animation and development field. My specialty was Adobe Flash, and there was actually a lot of demand for it at that time. Uh, I was doing a lot of contract work for high-profile brands, Audi, Chipotle, Victoria's Secret, You know, kind of across various sectors. So the, the money I was making from my nine to five was, was great. And we weren't making a ton of money on either of the uh, rental properties. A lot of that to do with the fact that um, we just didn't put a ton down on them because they were both, you know, purchased as our primaries, as our starter homes. Um, but, you know, we were able to kind of carry the cost, you know, cover our costs, I should say. And then, uh, you know, over over the years, you know, rents go up, mortgages stay the same. So they, you know, did become a bit more profitable over the years. Was that your goal then? Just cover the expenses and keep the places and kind of hope for loan pay down and appreciation? Yeah. You know, I I didn't really have 
much of a game plan, to be honest. Um, I just knew that, you know, if I kept these properties at some point, they would be paid off. There would be no more mortgage payment. And that at some, you know, 20, 30 years into the future, somebody would be paying, you know, rents that were probably double, maybe triple what we were getting at that time. So even though, you know, there was often months where we were in the red on those initial rentals, it was kind of just a long term play. You know, I, I probably wasn't even familiar with the term cash flow at those times. I was just, you know, thinking very long term, these will be a good supplement to our retirement. Love it. So how did you get into short term rentals then? So we didn't get into the short term rental game until somewhat recently. We had already had 10 long term rentals. So we were, you know, doing very well with those. All of those were, you know, um, in the black, making good money. We were cash flowing well. But the reason we decided to get into the short term rental game was mostly for our own purposes. You know, we live in Colorado, so we wanted to buy a mountain home that we could use for ourselves. Um, and then also rent it out to some degree to hopefully cover you know, a majority of our costs, if not all of them. But again, the thought of you know, making considerable profit on a short-term rental was not something that I was expecting. So sorry, what year was that? That was 2019. We got married in 2009. That's when we had our second property. And then in 2019 is when we bought our first short-term rental. Got it. Okay. So you bought in 2019. And how many long-term rentals did you have then when you got that first STR? Uh, we had 10 at that time. And all of those okay. were in Denver or the Denver metro area. Okay. And you wanted a mountain home and you wanted to cover your costs for it. I think that's okay. I think in short-term rental, you know, Twitter or whatever, there can be a lot of kind of hate thrown around about having a vacation home and then it kind of not being an investment you just want to break even on it, but I think that's totally okay. And I think it's also a good way to kind of test out how you feel about short-term rentals. What do you think about that? I think I think it's a great way to you know dip your toe, so to speak. And I think it's a good good to go into it with very modest expectations because then you can be pleasantly surprised if those you know expectations ultimately get blown out of the water. Absolutely, modest expectations, love it. So you started in 2019. How did that one end up performing? So we went live with that one pretty much like the first week of July. So we uh, closed end of June. It came furnished. So we you know, swapped out some of the linens, some of the decor, but for the most part, it was ready to go. We didn't have to furnish it. Uh, so we, you know, that, that saved us a lot of effort you know, compared to what I know now ever, after having gone through two other properties where we did have to completely furnish it. But that allowed us to kind of hit the ground running. We used the the property for the Fourth of July weekend, and then after that, we you know turned it over to the public, and you know had a had a ton of bookings right out of the gate. So my initial expectation, I was like, okay, you know maybe people go up to the mountains, maybe we'll get you know a two or three night stay every weekend if we're lucky. So that translates to eight to twelve nights per month. But very quickly, I realized that there is somebody out there that really wants to book, you know, almost every available gap in your calendar. So we, you know, we were out of the gate looking at very little vacancy. We were booking 26 nights a month on average. 26 nights per month. That's like almost, that's like, say, almost a 90% occupancy. Is that regardless of season? Is it like, obviously there's a ski season, right? And then I know that the summer can be really lucrative, but like, what about when everything's like melting? What about those times? Is there any kind of month or season that's off for you guys? So there is a, a shoulder season or mud season, as they call it in Colorado, which is kind of the time between ski season and you know summer break. And that tends to be maybe two thirds of April and most of May, and then also you know October and then a little bit of September and a little bit of November. But even during those months, you know, I'm looking at you know, what we, what we did in 2021, like our, our flagship property, the property that we bought in 2019 in April of 21, we did 22 nights. And then in May of 21, we ended up doing 29 nights. Okay. Are the prices lower though? Yeah. You're definitely going to see, you know, a little bit of that. And we, you know, I don't set my own pricing or very rarely do I set my own pricing. I'm using a third party pricing engine, uh, which is Price Labs, which I've been very happy with. It's actually, uh, I didn't start using it until, you know, probably in the middle of 21. But once I started using it, like it would set, you know, nightly rates 
way above what I thought I could get based on some sort of analytic data that it knew, you know, that there was high demand for whatever reason, some sort of event, some sort of, you know, holiday that maybe I hadn't thought of. And, you know, people would come in and book at those rates. So, you know, that it's Price Labs is well worth the money that I'm paying every month. I use Price Labs too, and I totally love it. I think it takes into account your amenities. I don't know, maybe your pictures, certainly the wording of your listing. You can, it, it looks at your reviews as well. So I, I totally agree. And I was asking you questions about kind of season and things like that because we have that here in Florida. So I was just kind of curious what it's like in Colorado. For yeah. us, kind of January, like winter's great. And then summer's pretty good too, even though it's kind of ungodly hot, but you know, kids are out of school and so people are traveling and things like that. We're a little slow, August, September, October, November, kind of 50, 50 in December, and then it picks back up. So that's why I was asking. But same thing, like you said, we still can kind of stay pretty booked, but even like the like even June, say versus February, the prices are going to be really different for us. But again, yeah, also Price Labs totally takes care of that. And this is not sponsored by Price Labs, but we both happen to use it and like it. <laughs> You know, one, one thing to kind of add to that. So in the, the properties that we own, the short-term rentals, one of the objectives is to kind of just create, obviously we're in a ski town, obviously, you know, we're near a couple lakes. So there is going to be that draw for, you know, winter sports and lake sports, but there are also spaces where someone can be like, Hey, you know what, let's, you know, our friends who, you know, live across town, who also have two kids, maybe three kids, let's just plan a weekend where we can go up to this house. You know, we can use the hot tub, we can sit by the fire pit, you know, in May, and it's going to be, you know, fairly comfortable climate. We can play board games, we can cook, you know, we can just kind of spend time together. I think having that type of property, that type of experience is how you fill in those off-season nights more than your competition. Yeah, I like that. That's really cool. So you got that first one in 2019 and, and you called that your flagship, but you expanded after that because you said uh, you have three of these short-term rentals, right? That's correct. So the second one we ended up buying in, we closed on that one December 30th of 2019. So it was literally within six months of the first one. And we were able to do that because going, you know, kind of circling back to our earlier conversation, my wife's condo that we turned into a rental in 2009, the fall of 2019, we did a, a renovation on that property and then liquidated it. And then using a 1031 exchange, we ended up taking the profits from that sale to buy uh, another property up in the Colorado mountains. So you bought your first one in July of 2019. By December, you knew you wanted another one. Yeah, it proved to be, I mean, the cash flow on, on the short-term rental was far beyond any of our long-term rentals. So the other 10 that we had were doing well, like they were consistent, you know, they were kind of our bread and butter rental properties, but they were not making the type of, you know, monthly cash flow that the uh, first property was doing, the first short-term rental. I get asked this a lot, but what do you think the ratio is? What do you think the difference is between the short-term rental cash flow and long-term rental? Let's see here. Let me just take a look. So, you know, that property specifically, on average, it's cash flowing over 5000 a month. 5000 a month. Wow. And, and that, that's after mortgage. That's after taxes and insurance. That's after maintenance. That's after HOA. That's after hot tub maintenance, uh, all that stuff. Yeah. Got to have hot tubs up there for sure. So, and I don't know, maybe, is there a market for long-term rents there? I don't know. it Because it, it's like a ski town. So maybe there aren't long-term rentals, but I know ours, it's say they cash flow a couple thousand dollars a month. They probably like cash flow more than what even the long-term rent would even be in our long-term rentals, I would say. You know, to answer your question, I mean, there definitely is a market for long-term rentals just because there, and, and actually there's a severe need just because there's a lot of people who work up there. They work at the ski resorts, they work at the restaurants, they're cleaning people, they're hot tub uh, maintenance staff. So there is certainly a lot of people who need to rent properties up there. This type of home, you know, it's a, a four bedroom plus a loft. It sleeps 12. It's about 2,700 square feet. It's on a quarter acre. That in itself would not I mean, somebody might come along and rent it if the price was right, but you know that that price would probably be a fraction of what I'm able to make by renting it as a short-term unit. 
How do you feel about having short-term rentals and long-term rentals in your portfolio? I, I know that obviously you have that, I have that. Do you think it makes sense from a diversification perspective to hold both? I absolutely do. You know, there there were times early on with the short-term rental, I'm like, why do I even have any long-term rentals if I can make the type of cash flow that I'm making with a short-term rental? But when I really stepped back and, you know, thought about it, it's one of those things where, you know, if we do drift into you know, a recession, you know, luxury expenses are the first things to go. So, you know, there might be a, a sizable drop in the demand for short-term mountain rentals. So those could take a hit. Whereas long-term rentals, in my experience, I've actually found that when there's a recession or when the housing market corrects, there's actually more demand for long-term rentals just because you're adding a, a new population, a new demographic of people who could otherwise afford to buy but maybe they're looking at it and they're like, you know, do I want to buy when housing house prices are falling? Do I want to try to catch that falling knife? So they might say, hey, you know, let's let's see what happens. Let's see how this all shakes out and just rent for a year before we buy. Yeah, I think I totally agree. Totally agree with that. You bought your second short term rental in December 2019. How did you feel in March of 2020? Very panicked. So the, the one we bought in at the end of December in 2019, that one was a, a brand new townhome, four bedroom townhome, uh, set up to sleep ten people. We, you know, three king bedroom suites and then a, a bunk bedroom suite. Had to buy the hot tub, had to buy all the furnishings. So, you know, we we purchased that one for about eight hundred and twenty thousand, and then probably spent another forty to uh, closer to fifty thousand, including the hot tub to furnish it. You know, we. We went live close to the end of February. So we probably had two or three weeks of, you know, activity, bookings, everything was going well. And then when COVID hit, both of our properties, basically due to county restrictions, they said, no more short-term rentals. You got to shut it down. So obviously I'm sitting with these two properties both that have mortgages, both that, you know, need to, they have utilities, they have maintenance costs and no real expectation of when I can start generating revenue again. So that was a pretty scary time for sure. Just to summarize, you closed on this place, December, 2019, you went live February, 2020, got a couple of weeks of bookings, certainly had more bookings. And then boom, your two short-term rentals that you had at the time get wiped of all bookings basically, right? How yeah. do you weather that financially? You know, sure. how, what can we learn from that? And how do you go? How do you go through that? So recently having purchased these places and having mortgages and utilities and all of these things ongoing. Sure. Yeah, there was a, a bit of a scramble. You know, there was a lot of analyzing, you know, costs, expenditures, looking at, you know, different assets, accounts, modeling, you know, how long can we weather this if it gets really bad if it you know lasts for two months, if it lasts for six months. It was honestly a, a complete anomaly that I had not modeled for. You know, I always look at the long-term rentals where I'm like, okay, you know, one place might sit vacant for a month, or maybe another place sits vacant for two months while we renovate. But this idea where everything shuts down, all of our long-term renters, you know, are a lot of them work in the service industry. So none of them were a lot of them got let go. So they were effectively unemployed. And then we've got, you know, uh, county restrictions that are effectively preventing us from letting us, preventing us from, you know, renting these short-term rentals. I was like, okay, this, this could get really bad, you know, really quickly. Fortunately, you know, we've got a lot of relatively liquid capital that we could lean on if we need to from, from, HELOC on our primary residence. We've also got cash value on some whole life policies, uh, just, you know, cash reserves in our checking account. But when I, when I kind of looked at everything, I was like, okay, we could probably last 10 months before we need to start dipping into, you know, uh, tax advantage retirement accounts, which you really don't want to do. I was like, yeah, if things get really bad, we've got about 10 months of runway before we need to start, you know, looking at either A, liquidating some of this some of these properties or be, you know, dipping into tax advantaged savings accounts, which obviously would come with penalties. So luckily it didn't get that bad. Luckily, you know, the government did step in and they had, you know, the paycheck protection stuff. Uh, so a lot of our long-term renters were effectively made whole, or at least, you know, given 
uh, an option so that they could continue paying their bills. That helped. We didn't, you know, run into any issues with our, our long-term rental renters. Um, everyone, everyone ended up paying. Sometimes they needed a little bit more time. We waived all of the late fees during during that era, but everyone, you know, paid what you know what they were expected to pay, and we didn't have any issues there. So that that was a certainly a relief. And then with the short-term renters or rentals, we actually got a little bit lucky. There was a, a family who they had like a three-day stay at our first property, the one we purchased in um, July of that year. So they were family of four, two kids. They were staying at our property and then everything got locked down. So I had to reach out to them and I said, hey, here's the deal. You know, we've unfortunately have to ask you to vacate the property, you know, a day early. And she was like, well, would it be possible for us to stay as long-term renters? Because they actually lived in Florida and they, you know, decided, hey, we can just, you know, if it's cool with you, we'll stay here as a long-term renter, um, bypass the restrictions on what were short-term rentals. And then, you know, good for them. They don't have to go back to Florida for whatever reason they didn't want to go back. Obviously, you know, there was a lot of COVID activity during that time. And then they could just kind of ride things out in rural Colorado, stay away from people, do the remote school with their two kids. And I was like, yeah, that would be fantastic. So I gave them a great nightly rate, basically just enough to cover my expenses. And they ended up staying for 56 days. That is so fascinating. And it's nice how sometimes when some things work out like that, can't imagine why they would have wanted to leave my beautiful Florida at that time, but right. no, it, it was nuts. Okay, perfect. So I, I love everything you just said there. And I guess kind of what you did was break down what an emergency fund can be. And when we think about emergency funds, I think a lot of times we talk about cash almost on hand, right? In a checking account or in a high yield savings account. So a home equity line of credit or these whole life policies, right? There's other things that you can do. And Joe, I don't think you could have possibly modeled for this. Uh, I don't think any of us could have seen that coming. Same thing. I, I had bought a duplex in like a D neighborhood in October of 2019 and I had budgeted, like, I thought, like, yeah, evictions, right? I'll have some evictions. I'll have some non payment, things like that. I did not know I was not, they were going to have non payment and I was not going to be able to evict, you know? Right. So you just, you just couldn't have seen that coming. And you, yeah, you had to, I think we all kind of had to figure out how long could we possibly go. So talk to me then about getting your third short term rental. And then I want to get into a little bit overall big picture numbers, where you're getting bookings, things like that. Sure. So once we had the two short-term rentals, one was the first one we picked up in July, which I consider our flagship property. That was a single family home. And then the second one that we purchased in December, that was more like a town home, which was a lot closer to the ski resort, which you know makes it m much more desirable in the ski months, but a little bit a little bit more of a roller coaster. You know, it's it's not going to rent as well during the off season just because of the townhome format, like it's kind of a ski home. So after having exposure to both those types of properties in February of 21, we were looking to pick up a third property. And our thought was we would, you know, kind of go back to the single family approach and maybe even buy a parcel of land and, you know, build an A-frame or something just a, you know, really cool experience that, um, you know, would effectively be our, our third short-term rental. And while I was in one of the areas that I was looking at land, there was three homes that were being built and I could tell they were being built because they still had like the, the gelled wind stickers in the windows. So I drove up there, you know, they all had the dumpsters in the driveway and there's three homes right next to each other. And I decided, all right, I'm just going to, you know, go see what's going on with these homes. So I, I went knocked on the door. There was painters there that day because they had recently, you know, finished drywall. They were about that far along. Talked to the painters. They let me kind of walk through the, the three homes. All three of them were the exact same floor plan. Look, different finishes um, to some degree, slightly different elevation, but effectively the same, the same home. So they, you know, let me tour the houses. They were, you know, really cool, had great outdoor living spaces, four bedroom plus a loft. So, you know, I'm thinking in my head, okay, this this could be another 12 guest property, much like the one that we had purchased in July of 19. 
So they gave me the builder's contact info. I reached out to him. He hadn't listed them yet. They were basically going to be spec homes that he was going to list in March or April when they were finished, but struck up a dialogue with him, told him I was interested in, you know, purchasing one before it hit the market. And he was okay with that. We, you know, he did have a a listing agent at the time. So he put me in touch with her. We, you know, discussed the terms. Obviously I didn't have an agent that I was working with. So I was able to get a little bit of a better deal there uh, because they didn't have to pay the buyer's agent's fee, but uh, ended up going under contract on that one uh, late January and then closed uh, towards the end of February in 2021. After we closed on that, you know, went through the whole process of decorating, furnishing, got the hot tub, everything ready to go. We're, we were getting ready to launch it as a short-term rental through Airbnb, VRBO, the usual. And then a attorney contacted me and she was like, so Sheila, the listing agent mentioned that you, you're know, buying this house. She's like, I have a, a family that recently lost their home um, in the East Troublesome fires, which were pretty devastating Colorado fires that occurred in the fall of 2020. And she's like, you know, they, they're basically looking for housing for a year, maybe two while they rebuild. She's like, would you consider renting your, this, this new home to them long-term? And I was like, well, I'll consider anything. You know, obviously the, my plan was to short-term rent it, you know, so if it's something where I can, you know, make similar numbers as to what it would be as a, you know, Airbnb, then I would certainly consider that. And it sounded like that was actually an option. So we discussed it. I modeled up, you know, what I thought a fair, you know, monthly rent would be. The insurance company agreed to it and they've, they, they moved in uh, August 5th of 2021. So they've been in place as a long-term renter, you know, coming up on a year now. And it sounds like they're actually going to renew for either nine or 12 months. But I'm glad you're able to help them and help that family from Florida. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, it was... It was a good situation. You know, obviously we were super stoked about this house. You know, we wanted to be able to use it for ourselves, take up our two daughters, our dogs, um, spend time up there. But the fact that we already had two other properties that we could continue using during that time um, made it a little bit of an easier decision for us to be able to say, yes, you know, we can help you out because we've got, you know, other options for rentals or homes that we can use um, in the region. So it ended up working out well. And, you know, the the compensation is, you know, very comparable to what I might have otherwise made by listing it on Airbnb. But there's, you know, the advantage comes in, I can treat it as a long-term rental. So there's not that, you know, daily dealing with inquiries, you know, scheduling cleaners, scheduling maintenance. The fact that it's just, you know, one family living there, it's a lot less wear and tear than, you know, having, 30 to 50 groups of, you know, 10 people coming through the house in a 12 month period. So it definitely worked out well for us and, you know, it helped them kind of get through what I can only imagine has, you know, been a very challenging and stressful time in their lives while they're trying to rebuild. Absolutely. Terrible. So the two short-term rentals then that are still being short-term rentals, Mm -hmm. where do those bookings come from? You mentioned Airbnb, VRBO, where, do, where are those coming from and how does that all break down? So, yeah, we, we leverage Airbnb and VRB. Obviously, those are the two largest platforms where, you know, if somebody's looking for a short-term rental, nine times out of 10, they're going to go to one of those platforms. And the way those are set up is great. You know, they make it very easy for people to find us and for us to, you know, confirm those bookings, handle the reservations, um, make sure that, you know, everyone has what they need. And, you know, it's, it's a good relationship and a a platform that I continue to use. In addition to that, we do have, you know, a percentage of uh, direct bookings. I would say, you know, depending on the time of year, anywhere from 15 to 25% of our bookings um, are actually direct bookings. And a majority of those actually come from the neighborhood that I live in, in Denver. And the way that came about was, a lot of a lot of neighborhoods, I would imagine, maybe the neighborhood you live in has have some sort of like Facebook swap group where it's like, hey, I'm selling this or, hey, I need a recommendation for a plumber or, you know, what's a good restaurant? Just ways for communities to establish a Facebook group and, you know, um, move items back and forth, have discussions, et cetera. 
So based on that model, I was like, oh, well, you know, the community I live in, you know, very um, integrated, uh, a lot of, you know, social media interact interaction. What if I created a vacation rentals group specifically for my community, which is actually fairly sizable, like master plan community in Northeast Denver. It's called, it was called Stapleton. It's actually where the old airport used to be, but they've re- since renamed it to Central Park. So the, the group that I created is called Central Park Vacation Rentals. And the goal is to basically bring neighbors together so that neighbors can rent short-term rentals from other neighbors in the community. So it's not just my properties. There's probably 50 to 60 other neighbors who are also part of that group who can promote their listings just the same as I can. And by creating that group beyond just what I bring to the table, my two or three properties, um, there's a lot more reason for other members of the community to come in and say, yeah, I want to join this group so that when I'm looking to book, you know, 4th of July weekend, or Christmas or, you know, spring break, I'll feel a little bit more comfortable by renting from a neighbor, even though they might still be a complete stranger that you've never met. You just know that they live in the Central Park community. And why as a host would you find direct bookings to be desirable? Um, again, it kind of goes goes back to diversification. You know, anytime you rely on another entity, another business such as Airbnb or VRBO, there's always that risk that something could happen. You know, there are horror stories of, you know, Airbnb hosts getting that email that says, hey, you've been shut down for whatever reason. Sometimes they deserve it, but other times, you know, maybe there's just a vindictive guest who said, hey, I, you know, I saw there was cameras in the place that I stayed and this host is doing X, Y, and Z. And whether or not it's true, you know, Airbnb or VRBO could be very quick to be like, hey, until you can prove otherwise, we're shutting you down. And if that happens, I mean, it it would be just as bad as getting shut down due to COVID. Like all your revenue, all your revenue could effectively go away. So having, you know, a direct booking supplement that's not controlled by Airbnb or VRBO is definitely a hedge. It's a way to diversify. Obviously, in my case, I'm relying on Facebook. So if they shut down that group, you know, there's risk there. But again, the more legs you have on that table, the more you can, you know, hopefully stay standing, even if one of those legs gets cut cut out from under you. Well said. Are there financial benefits to direct bookings for you or the guest? Definitely for the guest. You know, if somebody books through Airbnb, I think they're paying it's either 13 or 15% in terms of a platform fee. And then me as the host, I'm paying another 3% out of the revenue that I'm capturing for the platform. So that's obviously how Airbnb or VRBO make their profit. So when it when I, you know, go straight to the source or somebody comes to me and, you know, I'll say, hey, th- this is this is the nightly rate that we have advertised on Airbnb or in VRBO. I'll give you that rate, but it's still going to be about 13% less than if you booked through Airbnb or VRBO because you're not, you don't have to pay that platform fee. So the guest, you know, saves the majority, they save the 13% and then I get to save the 3% that I would otherwise pay to Airbnb or VRBO for the privilege of using their platform for that booking. Okay. Got it. So you're still using whatever price lab suggests for prices. Typically, there are times where, hey, if it's you know a neighbor that I know, maybe it's not like a close friend or something, but it's someone that I've had you know face to face interaction with, I'll be like, oh, you know, I can give you a five percent discount or stuff like that. But that's really kind of just ad hoc. There's no real rhyme or reason to that. But um, you know, having having a known quantity renting your house certainly takes a lot of the risk out, just because there's. I mean, nothing's for sure, like accidents can still happen, something could get damaged, um, even if it's totally accidental. But your your risk of, you know, somebody coming in and turning it into a party house uh, by renting to, you know, a friend or a neighbor is significantly mitigated. Absolutely. And that's partially why the platforms get paid what they do, right? That's why they're able to take these fees. One is they're creating the market. Sure. These people that are booking my places from all over, you know, the United States or the globe, right? They don't wouldn't know my place existed without Airbnb or VR, VRBO. Exactly. But they also provide like the insurance, you know, the coverage, the trusted third party for payments. You know, in the case of Airbnb, I, I take my own payments through VRBO, right? But 
So they're performing a service. They have a function. I think they're worth, you know, what, you know, they're worth paying. Yep. Um, but like you said, diversifying is hugely important. So just to round out uh, my little pie chart in my head, you have 15 to 25% direct bookings. What's the breakdown then of the remaining 75, 85%? A majority of our platform-based bookings are going to come from Airbnb. Um, but I would say that during the ski season, a majority of those bookings, you know, like the December, January, February, March, come from VRBO, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, totally does make sense. I'm starting to notice that pattern too, where if you asked me last year, I would have said Airbnb is 80%, of my, 80, 90% of my bookings. Now it's VRBO is coming out of the woodwork and taking over a little bit for the summer. So it's kind sure. of interesting how that, how that works out. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of it just kind of has to do with demographics. You know, when I think about the Airbnb user base, I tend to think, you know, the younger generation, more millennials, people that are probably, you know, 45 years old and younger. And then a lot of the VRBO crowd is going to be, you know, the older crowd, um, people that maybe are in their, you know, mid 40s to 60s. So, you know, if they're like, hey, it's um, I'm going to plan this the ski vacation with my adult children and my grandchildren, that might be why I'm seeing, you know, a, a larger percentage of VRBO bookings during ski season. Again, I'm just speculating, but that's kind of, you know, my best guess. You just described my family to a T perfectly. <laughs> my mom booking VRBO and booking a big place for us to all stay and ski. So sure. it makes total sense. So I guess just kind of in short here, Most of my listeners are in their 20s and 30s. They obviously have a desire to learn more about personal finance and probably real estate as well. And given my recent deep dive into short-term rentals, you know, having eight listings myself that have been created since January 2021, I get a lot of questions and people always are wondering, you know, what do I need to know about short-term rentals? What advice do you have for me getting, getting started and you've kind of gotten started relatively recently too. So I think your advice will be, you know, having done it for three years, I think is great. And you also are going to have some kind of super relevant recent advice as well. So I was wondering if there's anything kind of in closing that you could offer for advice for people who are kind of just hearing or just thinking about getting into short-term rentals. Sure. A couple high level items that I think are really important. Uh, one is to, you know, make sure that you understand the uh, municipality that you're thinking of buying in. Obviously, you want to get into a place that allows short-term rentals and then has a high likelihood of not deviating from that approach in the near future, because that's basically, you know, the death blow. If somehow your municipality or your HOA steps in and says, hey, guess what? We are banning short-term rentals, or we're going to implement these types of restrictions, or even, you know, high level permitting fees that can really make or break one's success in the market. So, you know, that would kind of be the first thing, but assuming you've, you know, found a good market where they allow short-term rentals, where there's a, you know, a reason for people to be there, whether it's a ski town or whether it's close to a Disney property or whether it's close to Mount Rushmore, close to the beach. I mean, there's a thousand reasons people want to travel. So as long as it, you know, creates a reason for people to travel to that location, then the next step is to say, all right, you know, in order to make sure I'm successful in good times and bad, you really need to be um, top five to 10% in your market um, in terms of overall value based on similar size properties in a similar location. Obviously, that's nearly impossible to quantify, but in thinking of it like this, I say, okay, you know, in good times, you know, let's say a market has 100 properties and there might be 100 renters to fill those properties. But if they're, if we fall into recession or if people are being a little bit more um, tight with their, you know, disposable income, maybe aren't traveling so much. Now, all of a sudden you've got a hundred properties, but only 60 or 70 people to rent those homes. Obviously it's still 60 or 70 people that are going to be coming to the region, but a hundred hosts are fighting for that uh, smaller um, piece of the pie. But if you are the, you know, 
the most desirable property in your community, you're going to be the first one that books. Whereas if you are kind of, you know, if you phone it in, you didn't create a a desirable experience. It's not, you know, something where people be like, yeah, you know, I, I really want to stay there or this, you know, it's just super cool architecture or the outdoor living space is amazing or it's got, you know, incredible views that we can just sit out on the patio and enjoy. Like if you don't have any of those things, you're going to be the first property to struggle when, uh, when times get bad. So that's kind of the high level advice. Um, and then, you know, I would say, you know, create create a place that you would want to be in yourself, a place where you would want to take your family or a place where you would want to, you know, go with friends, you know, try not to cut corners in terms of comfort places to enjoy time with other guests, like, the, you know, dining room table, couches, obviously the beds, you want to make sure those are nice and comfortable. I think that's great. And I will just break down a little bit more of what you said and maybe add to it. Understanding the municipalities is huge, and that means more than looking on Airbnb and seeing if there are listings. I just want people to know that just because there's Airbnb listings does not mean it's allowed. So right. I just want to point that out with your with your number one piece of advice there. Um, for number two, be top five or ten percent of your market. I totally agree that you should have something that differentiates you. And I've talked about this before, but in case anybody's new. What we do in some of ours is have really tropical, lush outdoor spaces. And this allows people to have a great feeling when they are arriving, which I feel like sets the tone for how they feel when they walk in. But it also just gives them a really nice place to hang out. That's something that we've spent a lot of money. I mean, more money than you could possibly imagine making these like tropical yards for people to stay in. And that's something that we've done just to differentiate us a bit. Um, We also, um, something else that we do is we just have like, we have dense places. Uh, all three of our all three of our properties are multifamily. And so that allows us to be a little more efficient with expenses. And so in a downturn, we can um, drop prices and things like that and still, still, be, still make pretty good money. And we kind of feel like we'll be able to tread water like that. We also have done what you've done, Joe. We have some short-term rentals and some long-term rentals. So in a downturn, those long-term rentals, you know, they'll basically, the rent will basically stay the same. And creating a place you want to be in, totally agree. Don't cut corners. This is something that I did initially. I bought a place that was furnished and I went kind of with what was there and, you know, just kind of got up and running. But now I'm going to go back and do exactly what you're saying. Take another look at it. Is this a place that I would want to be and look at it from that angle and kind of make everything a little bit, a little bit nicer from a design perspective. Right. Um, So is there anything else you want to add, Joe, before you wrap up? Yeah. I mean, you know, you made a great point about um, the, just the affordability aspect, you know, the fact that, you know, our flagship property can sleep, uh, can comfortably sleep 12 people via four king beds and four twin beds um, means that, you know, potentially three families of four can all come together, you know, whether it's multi-generational, you know, grandparents, um, adult kids and grandchildren, or maybe it's, you know, neighbors or, you know, all old college buddies, um, being able to kind of split that cost means that, all right, yeah, the nightly rate is $500 a night, or maybe even 600 a night. But when you split that between three families, you know, you're looking at less than 200 a night, which, you know, even a, a mediocre, lousy hotel is going to charge more than that. Absolutely. Well said. Good ad. So Joe, do you want to tell people how to get in touch with you? Sure. Um, if people want to find me, they can, uh, they can actually find me on Twitter. Let me, f- I can barely remember. Oh yeah. It's at fire five, two, eight, zero. So fire 5280. And the, the name is mile high fire. Obviously I'm based in Denver, Colorado. So that's where the name came from. Uh, so if you want to connect with me there, you're you're more than welcome to. I, I share a lot of thoughts on short-term rentals, long-term rentals, in, investment strategies, a few other you know musings. If I if I think that they um, you know might be relative, even if they're not you know financial or real estate based. But uh, I try to keep it fairly concise and focused. But yeah, you can connect with me on Twitter and then uh, shoot me a direct message if you have any questions. I, I always try to make time for people who um, you know are looking to follow a similar path. 
Love it. Thank you. I'll put, I'll put that in the show notes for sure. And everybody, you can follow me on Twitter at Adulting is Easy. I'm also on Facebook. You can email me at realadultingiseasy at gmail.com. I am looking to join personal finance podcast and talk about short-term rentals. So let me know if you have any ideas for that. Don't forget to join the Wealth Wednesday Twitter spaces at nine o'clock Eastern. And thanks again for listening, everybody. Hopefully Joe and I have made adulting a little easier for you.